Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Um, make sure we're on here. All right. Can I uh, have you turn with me in your Bibles to Second Peter tonight? It took quite a while to do First Peter. I don't think it will take quite as long to do Second Peter. Um, but who knows? We may. I don't know. But um, the, the emphasis of Peter's first epistle was uh, on the external suffering and persecution believers were facing from the outside world. Uh, the emphasis of his second epistle was to warn believers about the danger that they about the danger that was in their midst inside the walls of the church you see peter knew that if the devil couldn't persecute the church out of existence from without he would infiltrate the church and try to poison it from within and he would accomplish this through false teachers who would uh, peddle their destructive doctrines to unsuspecting and there's no excuse for unsuspecting christians we are commanded in every part of the New Testament to be on guard. Beware. Our Lord Jesus himself told us to beware. Uh, you know, I mean, all the apostles, all the New Testament writers, all told us to beware. Jesus said false teachers were coming. Uh, Peter said false teachers were coming. Paul said false teachers were coming. Beware. Jude says they're here. They snuck in unaware. No excuse for that, all right? But Satan and Jesus gave parables that talked about, you know, how that the devil would sow into the church the tares. And uh, they, they would look like Christians. Interesting about tares, they're actually darnel is the, is the term. They're a weed, and uh, they look just like wheat, all right? You can't tell them apart, this, the tares apart from the wheat, until the grain begins to grow on the wheat. Of course, the darnel are weeds. They don't produce any grain, right? And interesting, when the wheat starts to produce the grain, if you can imagine being in a field and seeing now the wheat and the darnel, now it's obvious. The wheat have grain on the stalks, and guess what's happening? They're bowing down. They're bowing down. You can always tell a counterfeit Christian. They may talk the talk, they come to church, they, you know, but they don't live a life of worship. They don't bow down. It's all about them. They're still on the throne. But they're here. So we have to deal with it, false teachers. And that's what Peter is dealing with primarily in his second epistle. He knew that these false teachers would infiltrate the church and they would peddle their destructive doctrines to unsuspecting Christians leaving the church sick and ineffective. One pastor, I think, put it well. He said, Peter wrote his second epistle to help believers face a world filled with subtle spiritual deception. Knowing that his death was imminent, Peter knew he didn't have much time left. The apostle wanted to remind his readers of the truth, truths he had already taught them so that those truths would continue to safeguard them after he was gone. Peter also knew that the deadly threat of false teachers loomed large on the horizon. He wanted to expose the apostates in order to expel their demon doctrines from the church. Never has Peter's warnings been more timely than it is today. The rapid advancement of mass media coupled with the church's lack of discernment has allowed doctrinal error to spread like wildfire. False teachers propagate their heresies via television, radio, the internet, books, magazines, and seminars, doing whatever they can for their own self-promotion. In the process, their deceit lures multitudes to exchange the truth for utter lies. To make matters worse, some in the churches, uh, some in churches today, uh, motivate, are motivated by cowardly fear of rejection or misguided notions of love are reluctant to expose today's apostates. Inside, instead of uh, instead of countering error, excuse me, instead of countering error, 
they either embrace it or ignore it in the name of tolerance. The Apostle Peter, however, had no qualms about denouncing the deceivers who threatened his beloved flock. He recognized them for what they were, wolves in sheep's clothing, lurking to devour the ignorant with their beguiling lies. Peter understood that false teachers are the emissaries of hell and pawns of Satan, motivated by the love of money, power, prestige, and prominence. Because they are masters of deception, they successfully peddle the doctrines of demons to unsuspecting souls, marketing eternal ruin as if it were eternal life. The only sure defense against their tactics is found in the truth of God's word. Peter knew this, of course, which is why he penned this epistle. As a true man of God, he was deeply concerned to protect those under his spiritual care, end quote. So with that in mind, let's launch in. 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant of, uh, and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Simon Peter is how uh, Peter chose to open his epistle. Uh, he used his um, physical birth name, the one his parents had given him, uh, Simon, and um, coupled it with his new spiritual birth name, the one Jesus gave to him, which was Peter, so that everyone would know who was writing this epistle, okay? You just put Simon, I know a lot of Simons. Just put Peter, I know a bunch of Peters. Simon Peter, okay, I got it, all right? The name Simon means shifting or unstable, whereas the name Peter, Petros in the Greek means a rock. Cephas, sometimes he's called Cephas in the New Testament. Uh, Cephas is another name for Peter and is Aramaic, Aramaic for the word stone. It's interesting, the spiritual progression. Uh, and it's interesting, his, his birth name was Simon, shifting, unstable. That's all of us, folks, okay? That's all of us, okay? Paul put it this way, using a different metaphor in Ephesians 2. We were just carried down by the, you know, just carried along by the current of this world. We were not steadfast. We were not standing against uh, the world, we were of the world. It was just take, we're just floating downstream like dead fish, okay? Uh, when you get saved, you become a healthy live fish. I can put it that way. You start swimming against the current, right? Uh, so we see those metaphors all throughout the New Testament. But it's interesting how that Jesus at one point said to Simon, from now on, you're going to be called Peter. Now, when Jesus renamed Simon Peter, Simon was still unstable, okay, and, uh, you know, shifting. He wasn't a rock yet. It's interesting, when the Lord calls us, I believe he renames us. He's got a name for every one of us. We don't immediately become that person. We grow into that calling. Peter did. He went from an unstable man to a rock. And that's the progression that God wants for every one of us who are his children. Uh, we're a product of the world. We were born into this world. As such, you know, we thought like the world, we acted like the world. But once we give our heart to Christ, a transformation begins to take place. I think of David's mighty men. Well, they weren't always mighty men, were they? I mean, they were guys who were discontented, in debt, uh, complaining, you know. All... Yet when they hung around with David, a type of Christ, an interesting transformation began to take place. They went from unstable souls to David's mighty men. And I pray that that would be the transition and the transformation that would take place in the life of every man and woman of God, that no matter what we were once we got, when we got saved, we would become then mighty men and women of God. He next calls himself a bond servant of Christ. We've talked about this, and I'm not going to belabor it tonight, but the term bond servant isn't even found in the Greek. Okay? Uh, we all use it, right? It's just not in the Greek. And I'm, I don't have time to go into why. Okay? The word Peter uses is doulos, which means slave. Slave. Now, okay, I will tell you that for many years the term, and even to this day, the term slave carried a lot of negative baggage with it. And so starting in about in, with the Geneva Bible in the 1600s, uh, 1500s, 
um, when they printed that Bible, they sought to soften the idea of being a slave of Christ since it had such negative connotations, slavery. And so they, they tried to soften it with bond servant or bond slave, okay? But actually the word is doulos, and it only means one thing in the New Testament, slave. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our life as we have known it and lived it, and lived it is over. And we are now the slaves of Christ. Look, there's some teaching going on today that's very man-centered and man-pleasing. And basically teaches that, you know, come to Christ. He'll come alongside you and fulfill all your dreams, all your goals, all, all the things that you, you know, want and desires and all that. He'll, he'll come alongside you and he'll, you know, do all that for you. The, your business will prosper and, uh, you know, all these things. That is absolutely untrue. When Jesus comes into a person's life, he's not just added to their life, he becomes their life our life okay he takes over and now he becomes the focus or he should be i'm just saying ideally he becomes the focus and his will becomes dominant many folks in the church don't realize that i know you guys do but many people in the church of jesus christ they don't don't understand that but it's not anything new because jesus said to a group of would-be disciples back in his day why do you call me lord lord and yet don't do the things that i tell you so a lot of folks today will call jesus lord but don't do the things he has told them. Why is that? Well, we talked about it a few Sundays ago. Because they're using the word Lord as a name, not a title. His name isn't Lord. His title is Lord, which means master of our life. And uh, you can call him Lord and him not be the master of your life. And that's why in the day of judgment, those who went to church, many of them, and called Jesus Lord and going to stand before him, you know, they're going to say, Lord, Lord. Haven't we, you know, done all these wonderful things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Well, then Peter refers to himself uh, as a, an apostle of Christ. And th this is n not new territory. We've talked about all these things before. But an apostle, uh, the, the um, word apostle, apostolos in the Greek, literally means one who has been sent forth with a commission. Now, we uh, read in John 20 how Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room the evening of his, of his resurrection. And he said to them at one point, verse 21, Peace to you, listen, as my Father has sent me, I also send you. So right here was the first time he commissioned them. He would repeat that before he would ascend back into heaven. Go into all the world, I'm sending you into all the world to preach the good news to every person, right? In fact, in Mark 16, verse 15, uh, again, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person, okay? Um, our English word ambassador is really the closest word in our language um, for the Greek word, closest to the Greek word apostolos. Of course, an ambassador is a person who represents a king on foreign soil. And actually, Paul does call us ambassadors of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. He said, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An interesting side note, and I've shared this with you before, okay? Um, one thing about uh, an ambassador would often uh, be sent by a king to negotiate terms of peace if there was rising conflict, okay? And as long as the king had his ambassador or ambassadors in an area, even though there was rising tensions, it still meant there was room to make a peace agreement or a treaty. If the king ever called his ambassadors home, that was a bad sign and meant war was coming. We are ambassadors of Christ, and we are living in a very antagonistic world towards our king. However... We're still here. So that means that God is still looking to make peace with the people of this world. When the rapture happens, guess what? We're going to be called home. And that's when war is going to start. Uh, so, you know what? It's, it's our responsibility to tell people, look, today you have an opportunity to receive Christ as your loving Savior. You don't want to stand before him as, your, as uh, him as your righteous judge and so on. 
So getting back, 1 Peter uh, 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The NASB translates that this way, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. What does that mean? Well, understand Peter uses the word faith here as a noun, not as a verb. He's not talking about believing. He's talking about embracing a belief. All right? And in other words, he's talking about New Testament truth, which would start with the gospel, of course, uh, the truth that we have embraced and built our lives upon. Jude talks about it even more clearly in Jude uh, chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 3. Uh, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for what? The faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And again, he's talking about a body of truth. We call it the New Testament. Uh, you might think of it as... A, it, more precisely the gospel but it's even bigger than that the faith is the truth that the church was built upon you can read ephesians chapter 2 that jesus christ built his church on a foundation of apostles and prophets jesus christ being the chief cornerstone well what he's saying when he when paul said that he meant that the apostles and prophets were given by God direct revelation that was written down and became the foundation for which our church, our faith, uh, the church of Christ, but our faith as Christians is built upon. New Testament truth, right, is the idea. And Jude says, look, uh, implying there's going to be um, a lot of attacks against the truth. And of course, we know that's true. The devil uh, you know, has attacked the truth since the Garden of Eden. Did God really say, you know, go ahead and eat the fruit. He doesn't want the competition. You'll become like him, a God. He doesn't, like, he doesn't want that, Eve. So the devil has been after uh, attacking the truth from the very beginning. Jude says we must earnestly contend for it, the faith, uh, fight to, to, uh, to you know, stand firm, uh, to fight for it, and so on. And um, this idea of Christians remaining faithful to and defending the truth that saves and sanctifies, guys, listen, is really the core theme of Peter's second epistle. You see, he comes at it from different directions, but it's all the same idea, okay? He is warning Christians about false teaching, and he's encouraging Christians to stand for the truth of God, the Word of God, okay? When he called it, like precious faith, he was saying that this is the same truth that saves all people, and I think he probably had in mind both Jew and Gentile. Now, I, I think that's significant, and I'm of the mindset that every heresy that would ever come down the pike, the Holy Spirit knew about it and anticipated it and somehow uh, refuted it in the Word somewhere. I have heard Christians, and I'm, these are real Christians, good, solid men of God, and I heard one of these gentlemen on TV, and he's well-respected. He's a good teacher. But he believes that Jews are saved in a different way than Gentiles. There's a different gospel, apparently, that God gave to the Jewish people that they would receive to be saved. And the Gentiles, he had a different message for. Of course, it all revolved around Christ. But, but you know, and I thought to myself, you know, that is not biblical. And Peter says it here like precious faith every one of us got saved the same way by believing the same things and so on one commentator said and i quote like precious faith probably speaks to the fact that the jews and gentiles enjoyed the same faith and therefore the same benefits in jesus god having given to you believing gentiles the same faith and salvation which he had given to us Believing Jews. And he's kind of quoting Peter, paraphrasing what Peter was saying. Look, you think, you, you think a, a big, burly, rugged fisherman like Peter wouldn't use the word precious. J. Vernon McGee said that's a woman's word. <laughs> precious. By the way, John is also a burly fisherman, used uh, you know, the, the word. But Peter uses it here to communicate to us 
Listen, guys, there's nothing more precious, and that is valuable, in this world than the truth of God, which alone can give eternal life. Turn to Psalm 19. And I'm thinking in primarily verses 7 to 11, which I'm not going to read all of those. You can read those on your own. You know them. I just want to grab the main thought. Psalm 19, verse 7. David said, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, that's just another way of saying the word of God, okay? He goes on to use several uh, terms that all, you know, mean the word of God. He goes on to say, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the word of God is, is what's in view. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. All God's precepts in his word. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and by keeping them your precepts there is great reward. There's nothing more precious than the truth that can give to you eternal life. We, we put so much emphasis on this life. And, and there are people that that's all they live for is this life. And they keep laying up for themselves more and more treasures on earth. They are uh, rich uh, from an earthly perspective, but they are pa uh, paupers when it comes to an eternal perspective. But Peter goes on in verse 1, he said, you know, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest says that this statement in the Greek is Peter's way of saying unequivocally that Jesus Christ is both our God and our Savior. The way the Greek is constructed, those go together. Not two different people, okay? Our God, one person, and then our Savior, another. No, it, they're both, it's talking about the one person, our God and Savior. It's Jesus Christ, of course. And one of the things false teachers always do, and remember now, Peter opens up, he comes out swinging. And he's swinging against these false teachers right off the bat. He wants to equip the saints uh, you know, with the truth and to encourage us to embrace the truth and walk in it uh, because there are, there are deceivers and wolves all around us. We have a path to walk. Didn't Jesus say that? You know, he talked about uh, you know, walking. Uh, you know, if, you, if you walk in the light of what I'm saying, you'll never stumble in darkness. The psalmist said that in the Psalm 119. Different places ta teach us that. Paul said in Ephesians 5, see that you walk circumspectly. And the idea is like you're walking through a minefield and there's only a small path that you know is free of mines. You've got to concentrate to stay on that path. The, that's the idea here, all right? Peter is saying, guys, I'm laying out for you what you already know, but I want to bring you, put you in remembrance of God's word, God's truth, because if you walk off the path, the devil is going to get you. He's going to, he's going to snare you with doctrine that sounds good, but it's going to take you away from the Lord. And um, remember, he's, remember he's, he's, he's dealing with the issue of false teachers. And one thing that a false teacher uh, always does or false teachers in general always do, is to attack the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter will really focus in on this in chapter 2, but I'll just read it to you. Chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among God's people in the Old Testament times, even as there will be false teachers among you in the church age who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, listen, even denying the Lord who bought them. So, they're working for the devil. And the devil wants to... Jesus Christ is the Savior. There's only salvation when you believe in him and in the true Christ, not a false Christ. So the devil, you know, he, he causes his uh, servants. These are people masquerading as apostles and all kinds of things. And uh, he uh, sends them into churches to preach about Jesus, but it's not our Jesus. It's a false Jesus, a Jesus that cannot save. But, um, you know, they, they, they're all about denying the Lord. And one of the main ways that false teachers and cults have attacked 
the person of Jesus Christ is by denying the deity of Christ, right? We've been talking about that a lot on Sunday morning in our study in John. And Jesus affirmed that he is God uh, all the time. It was a constant thing. He constantly went around claiming equality with the Father, claiming to be uh, God himself, okay, second person of the Trinity. Uh, but it, you may not realize this. We're going we're gonna to begin to touch on it tonight a little bit. We'll really hit it in John's first epistle. We know that the devil often attacks the deity of Christ. Oh, he'll, he's got some groups like the JWs uh, who believe Jesus is a God. It's not like they try to, you know, Satan's too subtle to just, you know, blatantly say, well, Jesus is not God at all. No, he lets people think, well, he's a God. Okay, he's, he's less than mighty Jehovah God, the JWs believe, but he, but he is a powerful God, okay? Now, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, John 8, 24, you're going to die in your sins. This is a pivotal doctrine. This is not something we can take lightly. But you may not know this, but the first heresy in the church was not an attack on the deity of Christ. It was a, an attack on the humanity of Christ. And here's what happened, and we're going to touch on it today a little bit. Uh, in, in, in the group that, that backed this, okay? Let me just say this because I'm getting ahead of myself. But there was a very powerful movement in the first century, um, heretical movement, called Gnosticism. And let me just, I'm not going to hang on to that thought because I want to talk about it more in a moment. But the Gnostics basically believed that the physical universe was evil. And they had a whole thing that they had um, developed um, where, you know, the, but the physical universe was evil. Therefore, Jesus couldn't have been a physical man because then he would have been evil. So he was a spirit. He, he wasn't really flesh and bone. Now, when you have that in your mind and you realize that was one of the major attacks of, of the enemy against Christ in the early in the early church. Now you read. Now you begin to understand when the disciples, uh, when he, Jesus came in, in the upper room the night of his resurrection, and they thought he was a ghost. And he said, "What? Touch me. Does a spirit have flesh and bone as you see I have? I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. I'm flesh and bone." John begins his first epistle refuting this very concept. He says, "Look, we saw him." We handled the word of life. Because he's talking against Gnosticism. Okay? Anyways, well, I'll come back to that. Let me just let me just come at that in just a moment. Okay? Um, so Peter, again, 2 Peter 1, 2. He goes on, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As my pastor was fond, fond, fond of saying, he said, you'll never experience the peace of God until you first experience the grace of God. You'll never experience the peace of God until you first are a child of God, and that's through the grace of God by receiving the gospel and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Warren Worsby put it well. He said, and I quote, Our Lord Jesus Christ has three spiritual commodities that can be secured from nobody else. Righteousness, grace, and peace. When you trust him as your savior, his righteousness becomes your righteousness, and you are given a right standing before God. You could never earn this righteousness. It is a gift of God to those who believe. Not, and he quotes Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Grace is God's favor to the undeserving. God in his mercy does not give us what we do deserve, God in his grace gives us what we don't deserve. Our God is the God of all grace, 1 Peter 5.10. And he channels that grace to us through his son, Jesus Christ. The result of this experience is peace. Peace with God, Romans 5.1, which is salvation. And then the peace of God, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. That's the ongoing peace we experience as believers in Christ. In fact, God's grace and peace are multiplied toward us as we walk with him and trust his promises, end quote. All right, well, verse 2. Again, Peter says, Grace and peace 
be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which, uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When Peter says, guys, grace and peace be multiplied to you, listen, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, he has in mind, first and foremost, an intimate knowledge, intimate knowledge that only begins when we accept Christ into our heart as our Lord and Savior. At that moment, we are born again. And that's the idea that Peter is talking about. Talking about this knowledge of God. The word knowledge, you know, we talk about um, uh, Joseph did not know Mary until after she bore Jesus. Well, he knew who she was, but he didn't know her intimately. That word is often used of a very intimate type of knowledge. We might have no, many of us did know who God was. We even went to church. I was baptized, confirmed, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Of course I knew who God was. But I didn't have, that's religion, by the way. You can have religion and know who God is, but when, if you want a deep, intimate relationship, you've got to accept Christ. And that's what he's talking about primarily. That, that's what he's got, he's got in his mind, that um, this relationship, this intimate knowledge uh, with God comes through the new birth. And This, by the way, was the same way Peter began or opened his first epistle. Turn, turn back to 1 Peter 1 quickly. You see, Peter opens up both of his epistles with this idea because it lays the groundwork for everything else he's going to say to us as believers. It all starts there, right? You can't encourage people to walk with God who don't know God. You can't encourage people to cling to the word of God and be victorious if they don't really know Jesus. So that's where he starts in both of his epistles, okay? And the first one, he brings it out because he wants the church to be strengthened against the outward persecution. In the second epistle, he brings it up because he wants us to be, be, um, be, to be aware, to be on guard against the false shepherds that have infiltrated the church. But he said in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 3, since you, have, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of god which lives and abides forever guys let me say it again all of god's blessings all of his great and precious promises all of what it means to know god intimately to be to be victorious over the enemy it all starts with the new birth that's obvious but we gotta we gotta say it okay it all starts with the new birth but then peter makes a remarkable statement that I think many Christians kind of gloss over when they read this and fail to understand the importance of it. In fact, in my mind, it's one of the greatest truths in the Bible. He tells us that when God saved us, he basically, he's telling us, he came to live inside of us and made us partakers of his divine nature. Further, he goes on to tell us that knowing Jesus, and I'm talking about now knowing him in salvation, and having the Holy Spirit living inside of us, listen, is all we need to live our lives as God desires. Now hold on to that. That's a big thing. And Peter's going to hit this pretty hard. But we're living it. So we need to really listen, okay? Uh, this is where the church is living today. I'm getting ahead of myself tonight a lot, okay? Um, just so you understand, once you have this intimate knowledge of God through Christ, you've, you're saved which is where everything begins, obviously. Peter is basically telling us we become partakers of the divine nature, which means everything we need to live our lives as God desires, we have. We have. All we need to live a life of power, victory, fruitfulness, and godliness, we have. Nothing needs to be added. As Paul said in Colossians 2, verse 10, you are complete in him. Now, here's the thing. Remember what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He 
He said, the, Jesus lives inside of me. But the life I now live, I live by faith. In the Son of God who lives me, who lives inside, loved me, and died for me. When we got saved, God deposited in us his person. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. His divine nature. Romans 5.5, 5, his agape love. The potential to bear much fruit for his glory. I mean, we have everything we need to be all God wants us to be, to be more than conquerors, right? Why do Christians languish in defeat, in fruitlessness? Why aren't we all more than conquerors? Didn't Paul tell us that's our heritage? Because a lot of Christians still live with a lot of doubt. Oh, I know what God's word says, and that's for that person or that person, but not for me. And so they waver at the promises of God through unbelief. And that's why they don't receive a lot of the things God has for them, um, because they just don't believe it applies to them. I was reading a commentary uh, yesterday uh, and uh, for the study, and uh, you know the great uh, publisher, uh, Randolph Hearst, right? You've all heard of Hearst. And uh, well, he was a very wealthy man, and he collected things. And some of the things, one of the things he collected was works of art. So one day he sees in a book or some a magazine a beautiful work of art. He calls the guys that work for him and says, "Look, I want you to go out and find this thing and buy it. I want it." So the guys went looking, looking about three months. Finally, they came back and they had a meeting with Mr. Hearst, and, and uh, Hearst said, "Did you locate the painting?" Yes, we did. Well, did you buy it? No, we didn't. Why not? Because we found it in your warehouse. You already own it. <laughs> We're looking for stuff that we already own. I'm convinced that is the, for the body of Christ in general. We're praying for riches. We're praying for power. We're praying for everything. It's already ours through Christ. We have to understand that. You can't access it, though, except through faith except through faith. See, one of the ways false teachers are able to snare people is by making them think that they have, listen, special insights and even secret information that no one but them, and often their little group, possesses. This information, they tell people, will help them to know God in a deeper way, and unlock the wisdom and power of God in a way that ordinary, quote-unquote, ordinary, uninformed Christians couldn't even begin to imagine. But it's all dependent on the secret information that they have, that we need, you know? Don't you love it? You listen to some of these characters on the radio, and they're not all bad in the radio, but, but there's a lot of guys that are, you know. And I've heard this so many times, you know, the ten secrets for success, the uh, you know uh, the the five principles for victorious living. Uh, you know, it's all these. It's it, it, you know nobody really understands it but me. I I found it. I I I stumbled on the secret, and for forty nine ninety five, I'll send you the CDs, and you can learn the secret too. Um, now we kind of chuckle at that because there's a lot of guys on radio and TV hawking their stuff. But there's a lot of other um, characters in our society uh, that are just, and, and now we're not talking about those who deal with Christians primarily. We're talking about anyone who claims to have some kind of spiritual knowledge that, uh, you know, will help you, you know, to uh, have peace and lead, lead a, a fruitful life and so on. And, and it, it just, we just see our, our country is filled with these, um, this, this information that nobody else has except our group. And we want to share it with you. Just send us your money, you know? And it's all dependent on their special insights or secret information. I remember, and I just looked this up to find out how long ago uh, the Heaven's Gate cult uh, existed and when they all committed suicide. It was actually in 97. I couldn't believe it was that 21 years ago, like March of 97, so 21 
really in a half years. But I remember watching uh, an interview. See, they taped, before they committed suicide, they all two by two sat in front of the camera and gave their little testimony and their little spiel and all this. And, and I, 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 after the fact, and nobody knew who they were really until it all happened. Then it all came to national, uh, you know, came to light nationally. And so I, I was watching a program where they actually um, played these little, you know, I think three or four minutes, uh, two by there was like 39 of them that committed suicide. And one thing that struck me was how many of them quoted the Bible and basically had a haughty look on their face that they understood the Bible when most Christians did not. See, they had secret insights that caused them to see things in the Bible that most Christians didn't see. Well, that's always a red flag, okay, unless you've been totally deceived by a group, all right? But um, we see this all over the place. Uh, false teachers have been peddling that malarkey for centuries, basically. Um, in fact, they were doing it in the first century church, and that's what Peter is dealing with here in his second epistle. And uh, Paul dealt with it. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But all the apostles basically dealt with this kind of thinking. In fact, turn to Colossians 1. And uh, let's just pick it up in verse 24. Paul said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. In other words, Paul is saying, look, you know, you, um, you guys have gotten into some of this teaching. This is Gnosticism, but you, you had gotten, you've gotten into some, some of this teaching where, you know, you're being told that these teachers have, you know, mysteries, uh, secrets that they are revealing to you. You're buying into that. He said, look, I got a secret for you. And the word mystery is a Greek word mysterion, and it means something that was secret but now is being revealed. And um, Paul says, look, God has called me. Um, God gave to me uh, what he wants me to give to you to fill to fulfill the word of God. In other words, there are things that God has kept from the Old Testament saints, which he's now revealing to his people in the church. And God's given me the privilege of sharing with you what some of this, these mysteries are. But he says in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints, to them God willed, to the church, to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Here it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So apparently, and not only is Paul saying that uh, it was a mystery that God was going to save Jew and Gentile and put them together in one new body, the church, okay? I mean, the fact that Gentiles could get saved, that wasn't a mystery. Even in the Old Testament, God had said to Abraham that, uh, you, you know, in Messiah, all the families of the earth would be blessed, all right? So it wasn't, it wasn't ever a problem for Gentiles to become Jews. They, that's what proselytizing was all about. What was a mystery was the fact that, that God would take Jewish believers and Gentile believers, and they were always separate, Jew and Gentile in the Old Testament, and he would make them one new man in the body of Christ. And Christ would actually, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, would live inside of them. That's what Peter's talking about, Okay. Paul is saying, you want a mystery? You guys, are, you guys are into mysteries and secret stuff? This is it. We got a secret that God's revealed to us that these Gnostics can't even come close to. Well, let me just say this, okay? The main heresy that was not only prevalent in Colossae at, the, at that time, but it spread, listen, like wildfire across the ancient world was something called Gnosticism. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. This is a mystical, experiential knowledge, okay? The Gnostics prided themselves on their knowledge, spiritual knowledge, that they claimed not even the apostles had when it came to understanding the deeper things of God. 
So, you know, you got the Apostle Paul, you got the Apostle Peter, but see, the Gnostic put themselves above even those guys. Oh, yeah, they're great. They give you a lot of good stuff, but they don't know what we know. You want to really know God in a way you'll never know from listening to Paul and Peter? You come with us. That was the idea, okay? It was the hook. The bottom line was that these Gnostics considered themselves spiritually smarter and wiser than everyone else. They were the spiritual elite, and everyone else was below them, which was one of the main reasons this philosophy drew so many people to it, because it appealed to the pride in men. We have had people in this church who have left because they got a hold of some teaching, uh, and I, I was accused of not teaching the Bible correctly after this person got a hold of some teaching that uh, contradicted what I believed. Uh, and I was just teaching the Bible. Uh, in fact, this lady said to me, you haven't taught the Bible in a long time. And I was really taken back by that because I was teaching the Bible three times a week at that time, okay? I mean, uh, you know, Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, all right? And I was in the Word all the time. And... Um, but she got all of some teaching, and so right away, you know, because I didn't line up with what she thought was the deeper truths now, okay? I wasn't really teaching the Word. Um, this is where we see our, or find ourselves as Christians today. Uh, so, and by the way, I went online uh, when I first taught this a few years ago, and I found actual Gnostic websites. They're still around, by the way. Those who follow Gnosticism are still around. You can Google the word, and you will be taken to the websites where these folks will propagate their what they believe. But, uh, but they believe themselves to be spiritually elite. Everyone else was below them, even the apostles. But that's why it, how it drew so many people. It just appeals. Satan is no dummy. He knows that we're, it, pride is in all of our hearts. He tries to appeal to it. But what happens when you, when you um, let pride be the driving factor in your life? Pride goes before what? A fall. That's what he wants. He wants you to bind to some weird esoteric stuff so that you embrace it and fall hard and maybe fall right out of any usefulness for God. But because it was so popular, the Gnostics... Uh, but, but let me just say this. It was also popular because the Gnostics, press, Gnostics practiced a form of mysticism which included various practices that appealed to people because it promised that they could connect with God in a way others who didn't practice these things could not connect with God. This is what made, again, Gnosticism so attractive. It gave people things, listen, they could do, things they could do to conjure up God and become one with him in a way that would give them power and spiritual wisdom that non-Gnostics didn't have access to. And so, if they meditated a certain way or chanted the right words or only ate certain foods, they could connect with God and reach spiritual perfection. Now, that's still around today. If not under the guise of Gnosticism, the mentality is around today. We see it in the church. Now, we just talked about uh, some folks that uh, you know, get, get, latch on to some teaching that sounds very deep, profound. Wow, I've never heard this before. This is really deep, okay? You guys go into that Bible study every week. That's, that's kindergarten stuff. We have discovered the deeper things of God. Oh, it sounds so good, doesn't it? I, my goal is to stay the course right down the middle. You know? Set a course, write down, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right down the middle. My pastor used to say you, the truth most often, if not always, will lie in the middle of the two extremes. Stay away from the extremes, okay? And by the way, Jesus said, often God's truth is revealed to children and the super intellectual can't uh, can't know it not because it's too profound for them because it's too simple for them 
and they want something profound that only they and their intellectual buddies can understand. Um, but this is what we see today. Information back then. Um, if you do certain things and you meditate a certain way, blah, 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 you can connect with God and reach spiritual perfection. And that was a very grave threat back in Paul and Peter's day. It's also a grave threat in our day. Uh, people in the church who think they are more spiritual than anyone else. And uh, the mentality, although they wouldn't put it this way, but here's how they think. I've outgrown the Bible. See, that was old revelation. I, I'm into new revelation, see. And so when you quote the Bible to them, they laugh at you. They, they snicker. Oh, it's cute. You're still holding on to the Bible? See, God's speaking to us, our group, in new ways. We're learning new stuff. Yeah, well, good luck with that, okay? I mean, they're in the know, aren't they? Oh, they're in the know. They have special revelation and insights into spiritual things that others outside their little circle of spirituality don't have. And uh, they engage in spiritual practices and exercises that connect them to God in a way that makes them more spiritual and more knowledgeable than others. Again, Colossians 2, verse 1. Paul said, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you. Well, Paul was a shepherd. He had a shepherd's heart. He really cared about the people of God. It really bothered him after he spent so much time. Here's a guy that got up early in the morning, and from 7 in the morning to 11 in the, after, in the morning, he would work as a tent maker. Then he would teach from, uh, from about noon to... Um, what was it now? It's about um, the hottest part of the day when most people were taking their siesta. He would teach, okay, in the hottest part of the afternoon. And then he would go in the evening from house to house teaching Bible studies in home groups. Probably get back to his place late at night, spend a couple hours at least in prayer, started the whole thing all over the next day. Here was a guy who was zealous for truth. I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God, he said, okay? So it broke his heart after he spent so much time pumping God's truth into people that when he left an area, these, these false teachers would come in. And you always have Christians who are, they're just gullible. God love them, they're just gullible. And, and, and you know, they're, they're so easily swayed. Foolish Galatians, he said, chapter 3. Who has bewitched you that you should depart so soon from the doctrine I gave to you? You know, he, he, but he was always heartbroken over people that would depart from the truth that he had meticulously given to them. And so Paul says, I want you to know how much I agonize for you and for many other believers who have never met me personally. Verse 2, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. In other words, on the word of God. He is the word. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you will be taught. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Now, here's the verses I really want you to key in it. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body 
So you also are complete through your, through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority, over every demonic entity that's trying to pump false teaching into your brains. You have everything. You don't need to look anywhere else. You want to be spiritual? Get into Christ. You want to know truth and the deep things of God? Get into the Word of God. Don't look outside. Uh, go into these these. Wolves in sheep's clothing? Again, verse 3, For in him and Jesus are hidden all the treasures, not some, not most, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Again, the Gnostics were always teaching people, if they meditated a certain way or chanted the right way, then all the secret treasures of hidden spiritual wisdom and knowledge would be unlocked to them. Paul said, baloney. That's a loose paraphrase. Fooey, baloney. In Christ, he said, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And by virtue of you being one with him, you have access to all of God's truth. Remember what Jesus said. Many of the, this is in the upper room the night before the cross. Many, many of the things I want to tell you, but you're not ready to receive them. Not yet. But when the Spirit comes... He is going to abide with you forever, and he's going to lead you into what? Some truth? Most? He'll lead you into some truth. You're going to have to start looking for the rest you know, on your own. No, he'll lead, he'll lead you into all truth. All the, all the truth of God is the idea. He's not going to lead you into uh, truth about being a chef or a mathematician or uh, whatever. Uh, but everything you need in the realm of the spiritual knowledge of God, he will lead you into. And how is he going to do that? Through the Word of God. The Word of God. Listen, guys, the only way a person can gain knowledge of spiritual truth and the wisdom to apply it into their lives is by receiving Jesus into their heart, at which time the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to lead them into all spiritual truth. John 16, verse 13. We just talked about this. Many Christians continue to be deceived with high-sounding nonsense today, listen to me, all because they don't have a high view of Scripture. A high view of Scripture. And Satan knows this only too well. He knows the quickest way to destroy the local church is to destroy the foundation upon which it's built, which, as we already said, was the Word of God. Again, Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, I'm going to leave it there because Peter is going to pick up on that. He is going to now continue in that idea. If he's warning us against false teachers, which he is, and against the false teaching that will capture us and take us from Christ, well, the best way to, to combat error is with truth. Truth. The best way to combat error is to know the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free from error, is the idea. So we don't need to run around learning all the spiritual, goofy errors in the world, you know? All the cult teachings and all. I mean, some people, God calls to that ministry, fine. But if you just know the truth really, really well, when a counterfeit comes across your path, you'll be able to spot it immediately. And so that's where we want to pick it up next time in our study in Second Peter. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word to be a light unto our path and to our feet. If we walk in the light of your word, we'll never, never stumble in darkness. So, Lord, in these days of great apostasy, in these days, Lord, where even your church is departing in many ways from your word. We'll talk about that more next time. But, Lord, we pray that you'll give us grace to remain strong, to set a steady course right down the middle of your word, not veering to the right or left but lord give us grace that we um, 
Always stay true to the truths of your word. And so, Lord, we thank you. We ask you to now bless our evening, guide us home safely, and keep blessing these studies in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.